are you going to lose when it doesn't have access to this generalized system of preferences? This is a move that the Trump... You pay attention with so much at stake. Seas are rising and chronic flooding will be the new normal. You navigate, you listen, you keep an ear out. You pay attention and so do we. We tell the stories of our time every day. In the 26th day of testimony and on the 139th witness, Shahar Zarnayev wept. We unearth what would otherwise stay hidden. There's just a lot of hate in this world. And that day, for that hour, we were humans. Across the street. The Red Sox have won the World Series. And around the globe. It's here and now. This is modern love. This is WBUR is all things considered. This is only a game. This is On Point. This is Radio Boston. On air, online, on demand, and on stage in the heart of Boston. I'm Jack Lepiars. Welcome to WBUR City Space. Always looking forward, paying attention, and knowing that your story is one of our stories. Good morning. I'm Bob Oates. I'm Lisa Mullins. I'm Magna Chakrabarty. I'm Jeremy Hobson. This is 90.9 WBUR, Boston. Welcome to City Space. How many people, this is your first time here? How many people have come to uh, previous um, sessions in our business in the era of climate change? A few of you. This is the fifth and last one in our series. Welcome to everyone who hasn't been to WBUR City Space. We are just entering our fourth month. We've done about uh, 50, 60 events already. As I tell everyone, it's killing us. But it's a startup and it's exciting. As someone said to me last night, but it's a nice death, isn't it? <laughs> um, I like to call this space the 92nd Street Y of Boston. It's uh, policy debates, it's lectures, it's interviews with authors. We've had a coffee house opera. We had Margaret Atwood read a selection from Handmaid's Tale, and then we had the mezzo soprano sing the aria from the Handmaid's Tale opera. We've had live podcasts, we've had cooking, we've had moth story slams, uh, we've had everything. So check out our website, wbur.cityspace, and see what's coming up, and please come back. I'd like to introduce Michael Toffel from Harvard Business School. This was his brainchild. We met a year ago, I think, right about now, a year ago, and he had an idea to uh, do a series on how climate change is affecting businesses, uh, that climate change is real, and how everyone has to rethink um, how, how they do business. And so we've been wor working together for the last few months, and it's been a fantastic partnership. So Michael, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mike Toffel from Harvard Business School. So I just want to briefly introduce to you um, the panelists today, and then we'll get right to the main event. Um, so we have a terrific panel uh, to think about energy, the future of energy. We have uh, solar represented, we have wind, we have clean tech broadly. Um, so let me tell you who these are. So we have Emily Reichart, who's the, chief, the CEO of Greentown Labs, which is right here in Somerville. Um, it, it's the largest clean tech startup incubator in the country. Um, she was one of their first employees and she's really spearheaded their rapid growth. Um, and she has served on advisory groups at the local, state, and national levels, everything from the city of Somerville's Chamber of Commerce to the Massachusetts Governor's Economic Development Planning Council and the US uh, Commerce's National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Uh, we also have Abigail Ross Hopper, who is uh, uh, also a CEO, CEO of the Solar Energy Industries Association, which is the national trade association for the solar uh, energy industries, where she oversees all of their activities, including government affairs, research, communications, and industry leadership. Uh, she also has a government background, federal and state level, um, had been the director of the Department of Interior's Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and the director of the Maryland Energy Administration. Uh, our third panelist is Francis Slingsby, uh, the development director for Orsted's US Northeast Offshore Wind Projects portfolio. Uh, he's worked here in the US, he's worked in, uh, in Copenhagen, he's managed a portfolio of, of offshore wind resources in the UK. 
Uh, and bringing us all together is Bruce Gellerman, who's our moderator, who's a senior reporter for WBUR, uh, who covers science, business, technology, and the environment. So with no further ado, let me bring you the panelists and our moderator. Thank you. So I'm Bruce. Thank you for coming. Let me say one quick thing, which I forgot. Our oh. Is something called Slido. You just go to your phone and type in slido.com, and you can type in your questions during the program, and then they come up on the screen at the end, and that's how you can solicit that information. Tell us who you are. Oh, I should have told you that. My name is Amy McDonald, and I'm the director of community engagement, but essentially I'm in charge of programming all this, this beautiful space. <laughs> So, um, hello, fellow energy nerds. I, I, um, I have. That's the password. I think you said that. I was told that uh, the the preview that you saw, that whole animated thing, was very sexy, and I've seen it a couple of times. But <laughs> I think this subject is extraordinarily sexy, uh, and and the reason I do is because the the grid, the energy grid, is the largest, most complex machine that we have in the world. And we have a very large and complex one here in New, New England. It's got 350 generators, 9,000 miles that can, are connected, and it delivers energy, wholesale energy, uh, to the grid instantaneously. And it does so with incredible efficiencies. And it's not just complex, but it's changing. It's evolving very, very quickly. Uh, let me ask you very quickly, who heard the story that I did this morning? Uh, if you didn't hear it, that's fine. <laughs> It was 10 minutes long, which is like three times longer than it should it could have been. Or, but how many people heard it? Did anybody hear it? One, a couple. OK. So uh, and my, my editor, I should say, Mark Degon, is here. He did a brilliant job on it. My, <laughs> and, uh, and the Earthwild vertical uh, topical editor is here. Her name is Barbara Moran, and she's here. And you might have heard some of the pieces that we did about Pilgrim last uh, week about the demise of the ending of Pilgrim after 46 and a half years of producing carbon-free energy. Now, we get about 20% of our energy from uh, nuclear power now during the, it'll be, that's kind of an average, about 20%. We have two nuclear stations, one at Seabrook and one at Millstone in Connecticut. But I do want you to turn around, and I'm going to ask to show you one slide, and I think these are very revealing. There's three slides that I selected. They're from the ISO, the, uh, the um, independent systems operator, which operates the grid, the New England grid, six state grid. So let's see. So, th so it's a little hard to, to show, but, but I like this graphic for, for a couple of reasons, okay? So I know, I know, I should have told you about this, but it graphically shows you from 2000 to now, basically now 2000, it shows you where we were getting, where we've gotten our energy from in the past and where, where we're getting it from now, and we are in I think, an energy revolution. There's been a transformation, and much of it is due to natural gas. The ups there, you can see 13% of our electricity came from natural gas. Today, it's 40%, and that's a result of the, you can see the inflection point about 2005, 2010, it was frack, frack gas from the Marcellus. And then you can see 27% uh, is coming from uh, Nuclear, that's going to diminish from 25. Pilgrim pr produced about 5% of the energy. It's now going to be 20%. Um, and then you can see the uh, natu natural gas, hydro, coal, oil. You can see how, how those oil, coal, almost non-existent, right? I mean, look, they were producing, what, 15 and 19, 34% total, less than 2% now. So the Brayton Point, you might have seen the, the explosion of the Twin Towers. They had Twin Towers down at Brayton Point in Somerset. Uh, in April, they were blown up. They were the largest cooling towers in the world. And it's a graphic uh, uh, you know, illustration of how transformative this, transformative this, this, this revolution is. So uh, let me show you the second one. I'm going to want your feedback on some of these things. I want you to tell me where you fit in onto these. So again, so the wind power now comprises, wow, why should I read this? I feel like it was ridiculous. I'm reading a slide. Two thirds of the, the new proposals. Now, most proposals for new energy uh, looking out in the future never come to fruition. But this will give you a sense of the balance of where things are. And wind, enormous, enormous 
and it's, it's just incredible. Solar is, is, is making a huge contribution, but much of it is, is wind. Let's go to the next slide, and I'll show you. Natural gas, very interesting, what's gonna happen to natural gas. We should have that conversation. Energy efficiency and renewable resources are trending up in New England. Energy efficiency is so unsexy, and yet it is so incredibly crucial. Four out of the five top states in the, in the nation that are mostly energy efficient are in New England. The number one for the last eight years in a row is Massachusetts. Not bad, not bad. But here, so PV, photovoltaic, right? This is the perspective. This is where we were in 2017. This is where we're looking at. And this is in megawatts of energy. To give you a just, I'm not sure, it's a very nerdy term, and I'm gonna shut up in a second, just the basis of the conversation going forward, is that megawatts, um, Pilgrim was like 670 megawatts, could supply about 600,000 homes over a period of a year. A lot of energy, 600 megawatts. But we're talking about now 2027 going to 5,200 megawatts. That's like 90%, nine, nine times more in terms of energy efficiency. Photovoltaics, PV, and then we have wind. You can see wind. With the total capacity on the grid, this is uh, 1.3 giga, gigawatts. Um, the total capacity on our grid is about three gigawatts, 30 megawatts, 30,000 megawatts. So you can see that wind, solar, and if energy efficiency is the direction that we're going in, right? And that is a lot different than what we got now. Okay, so that's the basis. So I want you to each, you, you, Francis, you're the wind guy, and uh, uh, Abby, you're the, you're the solar gal, and you're the business gal. Tell me when you see these numbers, what does it say to you? Ka-ching? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's a, a nice way of putting it, Bruce. And, and thanks for setting the scene. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Francis Singsby, and thanks for the kind introduction uh, and invitation to be here. Um, Ersted, just to kind of set the scene for, for where we are, and then obviously I'll, I'll jump over to the, the local dynamic. We are the world leader in offshore wind power, uh, which is very much a, a kind of staple of the northern European energy mix. And it's fascinating seeing the, the dynamic between fossil, nuclear, and um, renewable generation that you see in, uh, in New England. And then thinking how, how we in northern Europe, so I'm, I'm originally from Sweden, grew up in the UK, worked in Denmark for many years, how you've seen those countries take that transformational journey. And you know we see tremendous potential for offshore wind in New England particularly here in Massachusetts. Massachusetts really led the nation with the first um, dedicated legislation to promote offshore wind, an original target of 1.6 gigawatts. That's now been increased to 3.2 gigawatts, and it really kind of puts the emphasis of where offshore wind fits into this picture. And renewables, it's really putting the mosaic together to find the right solutions technically based upon pricing, based upon grid infrastructure and based obviously upon geography and the characteristics. I mean, we are intermittent generators. What we find for offshore wind is that the site characteristics with relatively shallow water combined with very high and consistent wind speeds enables us to have a very high capacity factor. And offshore wind is now trending towards 50% capacity factor, which in the renewable space is class leading. And that's why this is, I guess, about as close to kind of base load as one can really expect in the renewable piece. But you need to have that mixture of generation to keep a stable and cost-effective energy supply going forward. And we see that you know offshore wind fitting into this picture as part of that solution alongside the incumbent generators in part. Some of them will phase out. As you rightly say, breaking point, that was for, for starts, it was a very sizable coal generation facility. It was the largest coal plant in Massachusetts, the last coal plant, and the largest one in New England. I think it may be the largest power plant in New England at the time. It, it was certainly very sizable. And actually, those cooling towers you mentioned, they were only built in 2012. What an astonishing investment to make by the then owners believing that coal was the future, worthy of building those towers, then only a, a limited number of years later to see the entire site decommissioned. That is the location where we will bring our power ashore. So offshore wind is building on the existing infrastructure in an attempt to provide stable, 
reliable, cost-effective power close to load, we look to build on the existing grid infrastructure. And, and we see tremendous, tremendous opportunity to be part of that energy landscape, generating stable, clean energy, generating good jobs locally in southern Massachusetts and also in other states as well. We're very active in Connecticut, very active in New York and New Jersey. These are good long-term jobs operating these facilities, which bring a lot of optimism. Certainly, that's my experience in the UK. The folks that I worked with for many years in the Humber region of the UK, which is in East Yorkshire, a former very kind of large fishing, very large manufacturing site, they saw since the 1970s a really significant decline in their way of life and their sense of community. And then in the past 10 years, Ersted, along with others, has really worked hard to bring energy locally there, bring jobs locally there. We saw Siemens open up a high-tech manufacturing facility bringing more than a 1,000 jobs to that very part of the world. And we see that as potential for New England and for Massachusetts as well. This is not just about the energy story. This is about improving people's lives by bringing the jobs to it as well. What's interesting is that we are at the end of the energy pipeline, literally. We don't have indigenous energy here until wind and solar, right? Our energy came from coal, our energy came from nuclear, which we had to import, and then from, uh, you know, uh, so we didn't have it. natural gas, of course. We have pipelines, we have constraints on the pipelines. So now, it's, it's, it's local generation, which means that we have the energy security, right? And that is such an important word, you know, in, a, in an era where politics can be so partisan, I think everyone can really rally behind the bipartisan value of local energy production. I think that's tremendously important. I think it gives people a lot of confidence, gives people a lot of pride. Yeah. What's interesting is that wind and energy and, and, and solar, which I, I, I kind of stumble upon this over and over again, but it's a hard, it's a simple idea, but it's so hard to kind of really appreciate. The energy source is free. Once you build the facility, and it's reliable for the next, and you maintain it well, the energy source is free. Solar, it's, you know, so what's new under the sun? So tell us when you, saw, <laughs> when you, see, when you see those numbers, what do you think? Uh, I think I picked the right industry to be in. <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I'm Abby Hopper. Uh, it's so nice to have two blonde CEOs on the panel, so I feel like I have to <laughs> differentiate myself. This is a pleasure. Um, and I really appreciate being here with WBUR. I grew up, I, I live in, I grew up in Washington, live in Washington, and had a, a long drive to school every day. And I grew up listening to NPR on the way to school and com coming home to NPR on the way home from school. I stream it in my shower every morning. And so this is like as geekdom as I can get to be <laughs> at a, at a uh, This a, blonde does the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> we're, that's because we're smart blondes. <laughs> um, but it is, so it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Um, I would agree with everything Francis said, that this is, we are in this transformation of our uh, electric grid and our energy system. And as I think um, uh, totally spaced the Harvard business person's name. Michael. Who is Michael. As Michael said, um, this we're, we have to really transform how we fuel our economy. And so as I think about this, I think of, that's, that's what I'm solving for. How are we going to transform how we fuel our economy? And it is, you know, it's funny you called Emily the business lady. I represent over a thousand businesses in this country who are making a living providing solar energy, right? And employing 240,000 Americans across the country. So this is no surprise to me that we are growing and that we are growing exponentially. Um, there are lots of reasons why, and I'm happy to talk about all of those reasons. Mm -hmm. My short version is that consumers are demanding it, that people understand that our climate is changing, and they understand that there are solutions out there. And it takes political will and business savvy to make them happen. But they are not sort of esoteric theoretical science experiments. They are proven business models. You know, your company is a shining example of that, right? A proven business model about how you make a transformation from fossil to renewable. And so I think that consumers, be they, you know, homeowners, be they corporate procurement officers, or be they utilities, are saying, this is what we demand, and so market go out and figure out how to make it work, right? We're gonna buy your product if you provide it in the way that we want it. And so I think that really is the genesis of so much of this transition. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because what's happening though is there are mandates, right? So now we have these greenhouse gas emission mandates requiring utilities 
Here it's called REGI, but other regions have these mandates. And, and it requires that, that the utilities buy an increasingly amount of, of clean energy. Right? But what's happening now, and you're part of the solution and the problem, though, is that, is that we're having re-regulation of the industry because a smaller proportion, as we demand 20 year long contracts for, these, for, for your wind powers and your, your solar, uh, uh, so you have a, a utility has to sign a 20 or 10 year agreement, that's a fixed price. They're, they're out of the market. They're out of the competitive market. And it is the competitive market that's really investing and bringing down the costs. So I, I, it's just a paradox there, I, I've, I've noticed, mm -hmm. it, right? I mean, and its mandates are really beneficial, especially to solar and well, actually to, to wind as well. Let me ask you, just in terms of your innovation, you deal with technology, but it's, I think the real innovation, and tell me if I'm wrong, right? Tell me if I'm wrong. Is is the business model? It's the way the business is done. Solar has gotten a lot more efficient, but it's the way we're doing it. For example, let me. I'll give you an. I'll ask you a question. It's 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 not just the efficiency of the solar cells as I understand it, but actually the installation has gotten more efficient. Then that's the big, the the, the big bonus for over ten years from now. Am I am I correct with that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that that's another really big piece of the puzzle. And when I look at the uh, graph that you had behind us, what I think of is, what are the problems we have yet to solve in those graphics? Um, so whenever you look at solar, for example, you know that the sun shines a certain number of hours a day. Then how do you deal with that intermittency? Um, same with onshore wind. I say offshore wind is a little bit um, maybe more reliable in the sense of uh, constant winds blowing. But then I look at, okay, so then you need a solution where you can actually store that energy. So that gets back to your kind of business model uh, concept there. So I run an incubator, Greentown Labs, which is the largest clean tech incubator in North America. And we support 90 companies who are all working on solutions to climate and environmental challenges. And so we might support a company that is developing a utility scale energy storage solution. So maybe partnered with some of the businesses that Abby works with or Orsted that Francis works for. We also have companies that are not only um, building kind of that early stage technology that is more based on fundamental science like energy storages, but also companies that are looking at ways, whenever you look at that energy efficiency graph over there, what does that really mean? Well, there's insulation that you can have for your home, change out your windows, but then at some level it becomes about data. And we have a company, one that's uh, one of our um, kind of shining lights called Sense, Sense Labs, and they've developed a basically a piece of hardware you can attach to your circuit breaker box in your house. And that connects to an app on your phone. And the circuit breaker box basically does the job of taking every bit of energy that's flowing through there and telling you how it's all being spent. So in different appliances, for example. So you can understand, ah, my washing machine uses this much energy. The light bulbs that I have in my basement use this much energy. Oh, I have these wonderful holiday lights that I leave up all year, la all year long. Wow, those are actually 200 watts. Um, I didn't realize that, actually, until I became a beta tester of this product. So there are many different ways that you need to attack this problem. So energy efficiency is one of them. How do you become more energy efficient in your home once you've done those kind of more straightforward things, the insulation and the windows and, and putting the, the tape under your door to keep the air out? You need to think about what else can you change? What more can you do to reduce the energy use? And so we have several companies that are kind of working in that space as well. Mm. So when I look at the, the map uh, that was behind us, I really think about what are all the things that need to enable those technologies and help them to get to the wide scale that we need in order to really undergo this energy transition that we've been talking about here. And driving the transition, of course, is our, our, our need, our desire, and our legislative policies to go to, what, 
a reduction in greenhouse gases from over 1990 to, from, to 2050, and that may actually change to 100%. It depends on the place and the region. So, well, let's answer your question. How do we get from here to there? Because right now, renewable energy, although wind and solar, are, are still a small part of it, small potatoes. How do we get there? What do we need? Is it storage for when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine? Or what, what's, what's the magic sauce here? And do you have a company that's going to provide the magic sauce? Well, we do have several companies. I think energy storage is a big part of the, the solution, certainly. Um, but it's also energy efficiency. It's also all the things that we do in our environment that uh, basically use energy in inefficient ways. So, I mean, in Greentown, we look at a lot of different sectors that we call clean tech. And clean tech really meaning that you need to do more with less. You need to use less resources, and you need to put less waste into the environment. And so that can range from solutions for how do you make agriculture more efficient to solutions for how do you make uh, an industrial process more efficient using robotics, for example, and everything in between. So I think this is a problem that needs to be attacked from very for many, many different angles, whether it's buildings or transportation or uh, you know, agriculture, water, waste. There are so many different ways that we can try to just make some progress towards these bigger goals. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would echo the, the assessment that energy storage is critical to this transformation, right? Because our technologies are fabulous, but they don't produce electrons all the time. <laughs> it's just, sometimes people think that's like a deep, dark secret. I'm like, no, that, I think we all know that, actually. But how do we, that's the problem I think we really need to solve, is how do we store the electrons until, until we need them? And th that's the basics of what energy storage does. And I think once we unlock that potential, sort of the sky is the limit mm -hmm. on, on how we deploy. But right now, what we use principally the storage is the same thing we use in our cell phones, right? Or, or our Teslas or whatever electric cars we have, which is a, a battery based upon, <coughs> excuse me, carbon and uh, lithium ion, right? Mm -hmm. And cobalt. That, I think there are some other technologies, like depending on where you are in the country, right? There's, there's pumped hydro is... We have a huge pumped hydro station here. Yes, 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 yes. But you're right in that ad technolo technological advances in that that aspect will transform the market. Mm -hmm. And it's not just though when the sun is not shining and the wind is not blowing, it's sometimes in Denmark, you have too much uh, electricity being produced and you have you have to give it away, am I right? I know that, have, I think, was it Germany was getting uh, generating so much electricity or maybe UK that they, they had to give it away because you can't stop generating it. Yeah, you, you see instances of curtailment. And, What's and that? It's called curtailment is where you're, you're actually kind of not able to transmit the power, you have to kind of shut down. I mean, that, that again, is effective, a, a well-managed grid as well, and we're getting better. When we started in offshore wind, the instances of curtailment were much higher. And now with you know, modern software, modern technology, you're able to kind of anticipate in solar and in wind how the profile of production will look and how you kind of balance that in a grid to really reduce that. I think a lot of, you know, some, some, when you jump in both feet into an industry, You've also got to kind of measure that against the grid, and I think that's why you know ISA New England are, are doing a solid job trying to kind of keep that keep that in check. Um, I, I think you know to your point about storage, it's mass penetration of electric vehicles has a tremendous ability to offer a backbone, a corollary to what we are doing with intermittent generation. Uh, I remember reading that if 10% of California had electric cars, you would have the equivalent storage capacity for all of the inst installed generation in the state. So, you know, obviously there's a lot that still needs to be worked through there, but that again makes me very optimistic that you have a very kind of consumer friendly, a consumer driven initiative where people are in a large scale considering my next car will be electric. Mm -hmm. And then if that happens within five to 10 years, we can all actually help support this with the right software with the right nexus between generation and the owner of that storage facility. I, I see tremendous potential there. Yeah, imagine that you took your solar cells, put them on a car, mm -hmm. right? They're sitting in the parking lot all day doing nothing, right? Essentially, and they could be discharged into a grid and you'd have a virtual gen power generation system. I mean, pretty cool. 
Yeah, and I don't. I, it's cool, and it's also not unreasonable to expect that we will do that. Um, and I think it, it sort of proves the point that these we're operating in a system, right? These are not disparate. I, solar doesn't exist all by itself. Offshore wind doesn't exist all by itself. The electrification of our vehicles don't exist all by themselves. They are intricately related, and as we, thi I think we need to just think about them systemically. And so those those are big solutions, but they have so much huge potential. Um, and so I agree. I'm watching the T go by and thinking about the electrification, right? Like, I don't know, I don't live here. I don't know how your T's are Well, are sometimes it doesn't go. <laughs> <laughs> but think about that, right? Think about mass transit and if it is all fueled by solar and wind. That is a radically different way of doing mm -hmm. it. I spoke to a guy, actually, this guy, Dan Dolan, for the New England Power Generators Association. He said, it was really interesting, I thought, that we don't need more generating capacity because we've done such a good job on being energy efficient on the grid, right? That the real, where we need to cut down is buildings and heating and air efficiencies and, and vehicles. We need to, make, but he said, we can, we can actually make the transition with almost no power increased generation capacity and have a complete fleet of electric vehicles because the, the electricity is so much more efficient than, and less polluting than gas or oil or whatever you want to use, amazing. So business models, what, what's, the, what's the cutting edge of the business model for energy efficiency or for storage? And, is that, and when, you, when a company comes to you, right, and they say, I want to join the Green Town Labs, what are you looking for? Yeah, so I'd say that there's a lot of companies approaching this in many, many different ways. And often it's with a combination of uh, maybe an innovative business model, but also um, a hardware or a software component. So I think there's just many different ways that you can approach these challenges. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what we look for, we are typically, first and foremost, looking for clean tech companies. So all the different areas that I just mentioned, um, you know, ranging from the you know, more traditional renewable energy, energy generation, energy storage, um, waste, water, agriculture, manufacturing, efficiency, technology. You have to be in that area where you're really trying to kind of have a big impact on an environmental or a climate related challenge. So that's kind of level one. Level two is that you typically need to be already um, vetted by an outside source. So most of our companies have already raised some kind of investment mm -hmm. before they get to us. So that would typically come from some kind of seed investor, angel investor, venture capitalist, um, a competition in a school, an accelerator program. All of these are different options, but we kind of put the stamp of approval on the company before they even get to us. And then a, a very important part of what we do at Greentown Labs is actually uh, convene and curate a community of entrepreneurs who are interested in solving these big challenges. What they're doing is hard every single day. It's hard. It's hard to be in this industry. It is hard to solve these technical problems. And so you really need a community of people who are going through the same thing. And that is kind of what we've really cultivated over the years at Greentown Labs. So there's a willingness that you have to have to be part of that community, to give and take from that community. And give and take can be anything from providing advice about how to do investment, um, all the way to providing uh, an intern to help someone build something. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different things that these entrepreneurs share on a daily basis. And that, I think, kind of makes it all possible. It brings it all together, having that strong community of folks who are trying to, to solve a big problem. Do you have a great failure? One of your people that came in, a group came in, you don't have to tell me the, the name, but why would they fail? So a common failure point is actually partnerships. So often, for this type of company, if you are building a clean tech product, typically you are building a physical product. So not necessarily a software, it's an app that you can build in a coffee shop. You're actually building something that needs to be tested and evaluated in a real world environment and eventually manufactured. So there's that's, that's kind of hard in and of itself. But then um, in order to do that, you typically need to really understand the engineering, the materials challenges, whatever it is, um, along that path, and so that's that's a hard challenge. But in order to really succeed, 
it's not about what you do in the laboratory or on the bench while you're in the incubator. It's really about figuring out how to scale that technology, test it in a real environment and scale it so that you not just have one or two prototypes in a lab, but you have a thousand or hundred thousand or a million products in the, in the world. And typically the way that you can do that in energy is that you need to partner with someone. You need to partner with someone that already has the scale of their business in order to get your product or technology out to the So world. is that, but is there a cultural gap? Is the, is the gap between uh, youth and established people? With? There's a lot of different gaps. Um, typically it's very hard for a very small company uh, who's might be two or four or 10 or 40 people to work with a company that might be 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. So it's figuring out how, do the, how does the small company navigate within the big company. But those partnerships are so essential to scaling clean technology. So when that partnership doesn't work out, then you really have a, a big problem for the entrepreneur. Uh, sometimes they look to other partners, but you, know, you might have saw, signed some kind of exclusivity um, you know, agreement. That, that can happen and really just kind of derail the whole company. So I'd say partnership failures, um, that's one thing. Team failures are another. I think the best teams tend to be the really diverse teams in the sense of diversity in all forms. So if you have a business founder and you have a technical founder who are working together, that's the strongest possible combination. And so you need to bring more than one perspective to the business. Often we see just technical founders who are great, they know the technology, but they don't necessarily have the business skills to really think through what is this technology actually good for mm -hmm. and really understand how to work with a partner. And so that can be another big failure mode. I'm thinking of uh, government policies in all this, right? We're at a really kind of an interesting place because the technologies work and people getting it, and investors are starting to really get it in a big time. But both of your industries are really dependent upon not subsidies, but uh, tax credits, right? I mean, I think the wind tax credit, right, the federal wind tax credit ends soon, am I right? Or is it the solar? One or the other is ending soon. I think yours, how does, and, and this administration doesn't seem to be really wind happy. So w w how is that going to affect your business? I mean, it's a big, it's like a 30% tax credit, federal tax credit. It makes these, these constructions go. Yeah, I think um, the production tax credit and the investment tax credit, which were the two main tools available to um, to wind, uh, really helped propel the industry forward. And the equivalent for the solar space has, has doubtless done the same. And they're both being phased out. And we've come into this industry here in uh, North America in, in a time of these credits phasing out. So there's definitely value to secure the credits. But you know, we, we, we remain very confident mm -hmm. in the long-term future of certainly offshore wind yeah. and the broader renewable landscape because fundamentally there's so much demand and the cost of what we're doing is coming down. Uh, certainly in Northern Europe, we've seen costs decline by, you know, they're, they're 50% of what they were just five years ago in offshore wind and that's driven by scale. The size of the turbines we're able to deploy far from shore out of, out of kind of viewshed has increased dramatically. Our, our current generation of turbines, the rotor diameter is two Airbus A380s wingtip to wingtips. So that's four wings across is the size of one of these turbines. And that is generating a tremendous amount of electricity. That's why the capacity factors are so high. And this means that you're spending less on your marine engineering, which is obviously very expensive, very complex, to generate more energy because each position is generating more. It's interesting, you pointed to Pilgrim as you know a very large nuclear facility. It certainly was. Um, just shy of 700 megawatts, if, if I recall. Yeah. We're currently, the projects that we're currently, we have PPAs to build in the lease areas that, that we have um, off, off the coast of, uh, of Massachusetts, south, about 20 miles south of Martha's Vineyard. We're building projects in excess of that. So we're building projects which are 820, 830 megawatts there. That, just to give a sense of the scale of what is on the horizon for renewable energy, is, is pretty exciting. You know, these are not small projects. These are utility scale, almost baseload renewable energy projects. And that gets us incredibly excited. And we feel that the technological journey we've been on, 
back to your question about you know what needs to happen, what needs to change. I mean, where Emily is on the cutting edge of seeing you know these projects and these products, which could really change where we're we're going. That for me is just absolutely thrilling. But what I take great great kind of uh, I guess inspiration from is that we already have technological tools in the generation space that enable us to replace fossil generation with clean, stable, renewable energy. That's available to us today in 2019, and we should not lose sight of that. And that is happening across the entire renewable landscape. Offshore wind is not alone. I mean, Abby would certainly be able to say in the solar space, the innovations there and the growth of solar in this country in the right geographies where it's well deployed. I mean, what a fantastic low-cost technology as well. Yeah, and I would, I would add um, that, so you asked about the investment tax credit. That's the one that the solar mm -hmm. industry, um, so in the, over the course of its, uh, it's existence. renewed until 2021, 22, something like that, right? So it starts to step down at the end of this year, 30% uh, to, to 26 to 22 to 10 for commercial. But there is, I'm going to get really wonky, there are commenced construction pieces. So if you if you spend enough money or, or do enough work, you can sort of qualify for the 30%, even if your project's not in place by the end of this year. Um, but so it's been incredibly productive, $140 billion of capital deployed as a result of the investment tax credit. And so... You know, as we look forward in the next five years, solar is going to more than double its deployment. And that is assuming that the step down continues. But, you know, I, I think about it in a different way, right? I think about sort of this conversation that's been started in our country around climate change, finally, or maybe again, um, if you will. And it is clear to me, as I, as I said, I live in Washington, D.C., and the conversation has changed dramatically in Washington, in, in federal Washington. Um, People are talking about what solutions there are to climate change in a way they really haven't in the past few years. Mm -hmm. And as I think about that, you know, I have a lot of opinions about it, but as I think about sort of what levers does the federal government have and what policies do we know that work, we know that the tax credits work, right? We know, we, we could probably, I don't know, maybe most of us here would agree that pricing carbon is the ultimate policy we don't have a price on carbon. endeavor, but we don't have one, right? So as we think about what policies do we have that we have bipartisan support for, that's the investment tax credit and the production tax credit, right? And so I would suggest that as we try to get to a national consensus about pricing carbon, we continue these policies that make sense and that will accelerate our deployment. And I can't speak for the wind industry, but I know a fair amount about it. Um, and I know that these policies work. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's, a, it's a different frame than saying we need them to have our industry f like flourish. I'm saying we need them to address the climate crisis. Can I add to that? Oh, please. So I think that another uh, important aspect of policy that there is bipartisan agreement on is energy innovation. And so I mean, since the Green New Deal um, hit the hit uh, uh, the floor earlier this year, I think that there's been a lot of interesting bubbling up activity around bills to support energy storage uh, coming from places in the country and senators or rep representatives in the country who you wouldn't normally expect uh, to hear those things from. So I think that energy innovation is another area where there's a lot of common agreement. And that's something, too, that I think states can also take the lead in. I mean, California, New York, Massachusetts, there is a lot of funding that is going, I mean, not a lot, but some funding that is going to support these early stage companies and get them from a very early point, which maybe they just need to test or evaluate something and the test is going to cost a certain amount of money. Those type of programs can make such a huge difference to an early stage company. And so I think our Massachusetts Clean Energy Center in particular has been really innovative in the way that they deploy mm -hmm. uh, amounts of money that, again, are not you know, maybe huge in terms of number, but really impactful in just helping an entrepreneur move from point A to point B. There's one program called Innovate Mass that is really all about helping a company to partner uh, as part of the contract, they have to bring forth a partner who would be work they'd be working with to scale their technology. So if it's a company with um, a new, you know, more efficient compressor technology, they might need to partner with GE, and GE would have to pay for half of the testing or the mm -hmm. cost. And so using mechanisms like that, the state can actually incentivize these technologies to be developed in partnership with the 
private sector as well. So I think there's some good innovation around policy at the state level too. Mm -hmm. There was a company in Massachusetts uh, called Anabaric, uh, and they, they, because there is this mandate to have more storage in Massachusetts, and Anabaric is took Brayton Point, and and they're going to run the grid from the from your wind turbines. They're going to run it to Brayton Point under the sea, and then but then they're going to spend two hundred million dollars for that big bucks. But they're going to spend four hundred million dollars on storage, so that they, when your sun when your wind does not blow. It's, that's fascinating, though. So, but I'm interested, you know, you guys bought the, the first commercial wind farm in the United States, right? That was off Block Island. It's five turbines, right? How come you didn't build it? How come a little guy had to build it? And then you, and then you bought them up. <laughs> yeah, I only got here in 2017 when the, the, the park was almost finished. But um, no, I mean, that's a, it, it was very important to get the first kind of steel in the water as we say, for, for offshore wind, and to show that you know the US is serious about offshore wind and serious about addressing climate change. And then that, that project was a landmark. Um, it's, it's comparatively small by, uh, by, by kind of comparison with what, what we built and in Europe. And expensive. We, uh, it was expensive to build yeah. but per, per unit of energy. It was expensive to build, but it was fueling Block Island, which had crazy high energy prices. So the the, mar the economics work. Yes. They don't work everywhere, right. but they work there. And it worked for the pollution in, in, in terms of pollution because it reduced the, the carbon footprint to the island by almost 90% or something. Absolutely. It provided the interconnector that, that took the island off very expensive, very um, polluting diesel generation. Right. So, I mean, obviously, a, an immediate win there and proving what the industry can do and the costs of the... Um, procured power in the recent Massachusetts solicitation and elsewhere in Connecticut and Rhode Island have really shown that, you know, that was an outlier mm -hmm. pricing wise, that, you know, offshore wind is now very much in, in, in the competition well, in terms just, of pricing. So with the way it works, are you, you were with the uh, Bureau of Energy Management, or Ocean Energy Management, right? You were with, so they're the guys that auction off the blocks of ocean. Or the gals. But you, or, or the gals, okay, <laughs> guys and gals. In, in between, yeah. Yeah. Um, but and and the first the first sale was awful. I think it went for a buck an acre, right? They were a buck an acre. You could get a, an acre of ocean and and develop and you know have the developmental rights. And then it went for what? What was this? The last one, the last auction. How much was it? All in over four hundred million dollars. Yeah. Highly oversubscribed. <laughs> it was unbelievable. It was a phenomenal. Um, increase when when Ersted bought the original mm -hmm. uh, lease or won the original auction mm -hmm. back I think it was in 2015 mm -hmm. it, you were talking hundreds of thousands of dollars and within the space of four years you're talking hundreds of millions of dollars it's a funny funny story when I was uh, I was the director of Boehm and we did auction off the lease areas and it was the area off New York um, which is uh, really rich yes uh, and so they'd gone I mean I don't know maybe 800,000 was the highest it had ever gone maybe five rounds of bidding and so it starts out and round after round after round after round and I started freaking out because I thought something is wrong with the software because there is no way this thing is now at 22 million dollars with eight you know bids left and it went on and on and then we had to stop it so people could sleep and then we woke up and we did it the second day right. And I, uh, you know, just personally was on the phone constantly making sure that there was no, like, error in the system. <laughs> I was like, you know, because the New York Times was covering it. It was up to $42 million. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is going to be so embarrassing if this is wrong. But it wasn't. That's what the market demanded, because there was policy certainty and state leadership. So we, in the offshore wind here, we, we are blessed, right? We're considered like the Saudi Arabia of wind, right? I, I love that. I love that idea. <laughs> Just as long as you don't start killing journalists. But the, the so where, where does the business go? Is it, we, or is it, is it going to be your innovations that make this go further? Is it business model? Is it big bucks from Orsted? Is it... The, com the commercial side of things, where, where, what's going to, and how fast? How fast? I think we need all of it together. Um, you know, when you look at back on innovation, we are talking with actually not Orsted, but one of the other companies that um, has, so is putting up some offshore wind turbines. And there's a challenge around uh, what to do with the right whales that are in the water. 
And that is an issue uh, for construction and for ongoing operation. It's also issues with fisheries. So you really need technology to understand what's going on in those waters. Are you the guys that are doing the sonar? The sonar? There are sounds that repel the... So no. I don't know that we have a technology like that in our shop, but we do have a technology that is basically a robot boat that goes out and does measurements of all different sorts of uh, factors, but it can also measure wildlife um, that is under the ocean's um, surface, and that is technology that's needed to enable the construction of these turbines because you have environmental concerns, um, you also have uh, the need to do this as quickly as possible because we have a short construction season here. Uh, so there's shoulder activity on either side of that construction um, season that you need to be able to use if you can. So technology, I think, is, is it, the technology of the wind turbine might be well developed, but then every time you try to implement something, there are innovations needed around the edges at a minimum to so would you be able to, to or, implement that. Would you go to Orsted as a partner? Well, we would introduce our member company, who's one of our startups, to Orsted as a partner. Mm, and yeah, probably that's, already That's have. what I meant. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I would say to answer your question, I, I agree with Emily. It's all, all of the above are needed. Two that come to mind, though, one is around financing, right? So not, not simply sort of how many dollars are there out there for financing, but how comfortable is the financing community with the asset that we are producing? And so I think, I mean, I'm sure that's part of part of the, the cost reduction in offshore wind, it certainly is in solar, is that investors are more comfortable with how the asset <coughs> performs over time, and so there's much less risk priced into the, into the model, right? And so as we think about, uh, you know, solar is pretty predictable at the moment as we add storage to it, right? How do we more quickly bring the, sort of the risk profile down so that the financing remains, um, remains competitive? Similarly with, with residential customers, right? It's easy for someone who has an amazing credit store, score <coughs> to get a really good financing deal. But how do you get uh, people who maybe don't have such a good credit score or maybe don't, you know, don't have different financial backgrounds? And how do we get investor classes comfortable with financing those large offtakes of resi projects. So those are interesting. And then the other sort of phenomenon I see, certainly in the solar space, is corporate procurement. Corporate procurement is a huge piece of the puzzle. You mean companies buying solar? Absolutely. Installing it on their facility? Both installing it on their facility and engaging in some sort of electronic transaction to fund or, or buy sort of buy offtake from a solar farm or a wind farm um, for their data center or for whatever. So we are all familiar with the Facebooks and the Googles that are doing it. But what we have seen are sort of the next level down of corporates, right, who either want it for corporate sustainability and or because it's cheaper, right? And so they are much less sophisticated players. They don't have perhaps whole offices dedicated to energy procurement. And so trying to make that procurement process more accessible and more understandable and easier so that you know much smaller companies can also partake of this, I think will transform that marketplace as well. What about jobs? How many jobs has solar generated? About 242,000 in the United States right now. 242,000. Yeah. And where do you see that going in 10 years? So we, th so we actually uh, think in the next 10 years, we're at about 2.3% of generation now. We think we'll be at 20% by the end of 2030. So give me a You're decade. You're going to be at 20%? We are going to be at 20%. This transformation is going to happen quickly. Yes. So it'll be more in California, less in North Dakota, but on average, 20%. And at that, we'll be at about 600,000 Americans working in solar. And uh, offshore, where are you guys? Because you don't, you don't need anybody to run the things. Once they're, <laughs> one, I mean, you, you, well, you don't, right? I mean, they're maintenance. They're, they're, you know, only to maintain them. I know that. But there's a heck of a lot of them to construct, too, right? Right, and that's process. right. That's true. Yeah. You're you're talking thousands of jobs in construction, uh, and these are very high skilled jobs: um, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers working offshore. Um, and what you have when you have a, a program of assets to build is that workforce being mobilized, not just for one project, but really seeing you know, decades of employment in a very specialized area um, to the operations of the facilities. You have a number of people involved in that, not just from 
us as the, I guess, the owner of the asset, you also have the service providers, the people who put the equipment in as well. So it is a whole industry that supports that. And you I know that's the most demand, in-demand job in the United States, according to the Labor Bureau, I guess it is, is, is um, wind turbine engineer. It's certainly one of the fastest growing um, blue collar jobs in the nation. And you know we see what's so wonderful about this industry is that it's generating jobs, perhaps not in the kind of, not in Boston or London or Copenhagen, where these jobs would just be an addition on what is already a success story. They're generating jobs in localities which haven't seen that economic growth story for a long time. And that personally is incredibly motivating. Mm -hmm. So, but, you know, you were talking about the size of the offshore wind blades, right? They're enormous and they're made in overseas, right? We don't have the facilities, right? And it's these huge ships have to, specialized ships have to, you know, are you going to stop making those here? Because <laughs> that's a big bucks item. I, I sincerely hope so. I, I think, you know, what we've shown, um, offshore wind started in Denmark. Uh, Denmark is a country, it didn't have the natural resources that Norway or Sweden had. It didn't have abundant hydro or nuclear. Um, and it was burning a lot of coal. And it said to itself, well, you know, clearly we want energy security. It started back in the 70s after the oil spike. And they said, what have we got? We got wind. And that was why they started building wind turbines. And then in 1991, uh, some of my colleagues um, had the visionary idea of saying, well, it blows a little harder and a little more constantly offshore. Why don't we put it offshore? And it was like, you're mad. What are you doing, Klaus? Don't do that. It's a ridiculous idea. So they did it. And they built the first wind farm offshore in 1991. And since then, what you've seen is that Denmark generated many of the companies that pioneered wind. There's companies such as Vestas, who's one of the Danish national champions. Siemens make a lot of, uh, of, of wind turbines. Well, they bought a Danish company. That was the platform. But when they see the market growing enough, they build the manufacturing facilities in those markets. These are such large infrastructure and such fragile infrastructure as well. Each of these blades is some of the most complex manual engineering anywhere on the planet. Mm. You don't want to transport it a quarter of the way around the globe mm. if you can build it nearby and know that it's going to be in pristine condition because you've got highly skilled workers delivering it to where you need it. So when you have that visibility of projects coming up, this is creating a future industry. This is where job growth will happen in the 21st century. And it's the, what we're seeing in Northern Europe. It's what we hope for here in North America. You know, the competition is fierce among states. I mean, New Jersey, New York, um, on, and Maryland. Massachusetts. Give Maryland wrote, some love. Oh, okay, Maryland. I'll give it to you guys. We're one of the pioneers. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, the competition is fierce. Everybody wants to be saying, we've, you know, it's incredible. And Rhode Island is getting into the act big time too. So let's take some questions, okay? If you have them, send them our way. Do you, you can use this. You got some? Oh, okay. Let me turn on this little gizmo here. This is really cool. I like this. Let's, let's see. Hold on. I have to swipe to unlock. There it is. Ah, wow, we got a lot. Okay, so let's see. Anonymous. They're all anonymous. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll start with anonymous. Uh, which type of battery technology do you think is scalable, interesting word, enough in terms of megawatt capacity to support the electric grid? So battery technology, which do you think is scalable? Yeah. Uh, it's, an interest, it's a very interesting question. I think we talked about two examples. Um, you know, one could be kind of the aggregation of modular, you know, so a more modular right. approach. You know, all the electric vehicles uh, that are tied up uh, outside homes and businesses. And uh, it's, and the new, the cutting edge technology is really around um, what they, it's basically kind of more of a... Um, Liquid, flow battery. Yeah, flow battery. Flow batteries. Yes. Which you can build them, modularize them, put right. them into a container. And these batteries are the size of, of a semi truck. I yeah. mean, that's that's the type of, of energy storage size you're talking about whenever you're dealing with utility scale. So that's chemical storage. Mm -hmm. So there's other kinds of storage, right? We have, you know, rubber bands or sto energy storage devices. <laughs> uh, but but it, the one of them, maybe you heard of this, is at Harvard, they would, they're different chemistries, right? Different chemistry, rhubarb. You can take rhubarb as be the active ingredient. You know, it's, 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 don't hey, don't laugh. You know, <laughs> works for pie. Um, so, um, 
But so there's different storage. Do you guys are you hooking up with storage at all in your projects? Are you planning storage and 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 are they increasingly doing storage in solar? So absolutely, I would say uh, most of my companies on bids they're giving for utility scale projects, they are bidding both solar only and solar plus storage. There isn't as much uptake of the of the solar plus storage product, but people want to understand the pricing, um, and so there are certainly some some projects that are getting built solar plus storage, but it's not the majority yet. Um, there are a couple of states on the residential side where where consumers, you know, homeowners like you and I, are given the option to buy solar plus storage now. So California, Hawaii, maybe here in mm -hmm. Massachusetts, um, a couple of companies are doing that and more clearly more to come. And then if you think about sort of that commercial and industrial sector and think about businesses that need that energy security, so business security, so places that run labs or run refrigeration or run, you know, have food supply and need constant, so they, they cannot for business reasons have their energy um, disrupted. It has huge economic consequences. Storage, even at a higher price point, makes economic sense today. And are the companies that you're selling to, are you selling wind and storage at this point or no? We, we certainly have storage attached to, uh, to some of our projects in the European portfolio. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you know, it's very much market by market. As you say, different states incentivize storage and different grids require storage. So it is really kind of matching the two up to understand what value storage can bring. Obviously, you know, it enables you to to firm intermittent generation, which is tremendously valuable, that has many different applications in the context of a grid. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, understanding the economics and the benefits of that is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. We and you mentioned who mentioned pump storage here? It was yeah. So pump storage is, is water basically using water, sending it down into a, a generator and, and and using gravity, and then pumping it back up when the energy is cheap, and then rinse and repeat, right. right? We got a huge one. It's located in, in a mountain here. It's really, it's really cool, really cool. <laughs> um, let's go. So uh, from market and policy standpoint, okay, from market and policy standpoint, what needs to happen? So the electric generation at distribution layer, you guys are really nerdy, layer of the grid can compete with transitional bulk power. From market and policy standpoint, what needs to happen so that the electricity generation at distribution layer of the grid, distribution layer of the grid can compete. I'm not sure the question of the distribution layer there. Somebody want to give me that? I, that's the term. I, please. Well, there's, uh, there's basic substation level. You have the distribution where most of the solar panels and uh, wind farms and this and that produce power, which is above the substation generating nuclear power. So you can separate the two segments basically as a distribution layer of bulk power. So, but are you talking about behind the meter generation or no? Is that, I'm missing the point? Oh, yeah. So I would say, first of all, just um, about if you look at the, so the solar market in Massachusetts is different than the rest of the country, right? And all energy is local. Here in Massachusetts, about 90% behind the meter. Nationally, it's only about 20% behind the meter, 20% resi. Do you understand that term, behind the meter oh, meaning? So, yeah, but, uh, the like connected to the distribution grid as opposed to the transmission grid. Right. Um, but the vast majority of solar is at the transmission, the bulk power level. Um, so what needs to happen, I would say, uh, we talked about it in the green room. We talked about sort of being able to aggregate distribution assets into wholesale energy markets. That sounds super wonky. The, the translated version, which my governor would always say, make sure everyone can understand it, is that we just want fair rules and we want to be compensated for the, the attributes we bring to the grid. So regardless of whether it's you know on my house or in a big farm, solar farm in the desert, I want to be treated the same as a coal generator or a nuclear generator. I want to know what the rules are, and then I want to be able to provide a solution and get paid for providing that solution. So that, I'm happy to talk more wonky later, but that's my short version. What proposed Massachusetts policy is potentially most beneficial to your industry, but most at risk of not getting passed? Ooh, that's a delicious question, actually. <laughs> OK, so what proposed? This is a, a little bit of deciphering, but I like this. What proposed Massachusetts policy is potentially most beneficial to your industry, but most at risk of not getting passed? Can I answer that? Yeah. You want me to try that one? Go for it. Carbon pricing. Mm. 
that's the one, right? I mean, it's starting to get momentum. A deep, uh, uh, what is his name? Pacheco, Senator Pacheco has been a big, big advocate, and Barrett. and Michael Barrett from from uh, from Lexington, Concord, Acton, around there. He's really interested in this stuff, and it's starting to get momentum. There may be a federal legislation, but that would the one of potentially has most potential and is risk it not getting passed. But I think it's inevitable. What do you think? I mean, the, the momentum for carbon pricing is enormous now. Am I right? So there's been an inflection point, or maybe I'm wrong. No? Yes? Because carbon pricing, well, go ahead. Take a shot. I would say, I, I would not say inevitable. I would agree with you that momentum is shifting. Um, I think as we see more and more corporate entities and I see legislators on both sides of the aisle, perhaps most of them are, are retired, but, um, but uh, understanding that pricing externalities, right, and really putting the appropriate um, mechanisms in place to, to create that equal playing field are important, but um, I don't feel comfortable quite saying inevitable yet. Mm -hmm. and if we did have carbon pricing, would that be transformative? Hugely. You agree? I just wonder if it's something that a state could make the decision to do unilaterally, given the impact it would have on the economic competitiveness of certain industries there. I, you know, I, 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 I would love to see that mm -hmm. mature into something, but I believe it has to be applied at the federal level. Washington or the state region. has tried to do it. What's that? Why, Washington state has tried to do it. And it failed. And it failed. British Columbia, though, has done it, and right. that's a province, and it is act very successful. Massachusetts governor is trying to get 11 states in our region, from Virginia up to Maine, to agree to carbon pricing. So having it at a subnational level, regional level of carbon pricing. Carbon uh, pricing, basically, everybody know we're throwing around these terms. You kind of know what we're talking about? No? Carbon pricing is basically put a price on carbon for fuel, all fuels, right? If they come into a state or a carbon into a region, if it has a carbon content, it gets taxed, and, and the, the money what you do with the tax is debatable, but basically it levelizes the playing field. And you're basically uh, paying for the contribution of clean energy, right? You're compensating for the clean energies uh, by, by taxing the dirty energies. Is that good enough? So let's move on. Um, please talk about the potential of high voltage DC. God, you guys are so nerdy long-distance transmission lines to facilitate the massive incorporation of solar and wind into the grid. If somebody define the terms, because I kind of get it, but it's, go ahead. Yeah, happy to. Uh, in essence, you've got two transmission technologies, high-voltage AC and high-voltage DC. Um, and what you've seen is different markets adopt different technologies. And it, it, there's an inflection point, which is normally distance, where HVDC becomes attractive because the electrical losses are significantly reduced over long distances. And what you've seen is that in markets where transmission infrastructure is planned and built, almost like an offshore plug that you would plug your generator asset into, an HVDC solution can conceptually appear very attractive. That's what happened in Germany, for example. Uh, the only problem was in Germany was that the technology arrived later the plug wasn't there when the wind farms were ready to plug in. And that meant that the German consumer was on the hook for facilities that weren't able to generate because there was no transmission link. And this was actually a national embarrassment. And so it needs to be very well organized. An HVDC system is a very effective scale tool. It's a very effective distance tool. But um, actually what we've seen historically is that individual wind farms connecting directly into the grid is a good way of ensuring that the various packages of work, the various pieces of work to make sure everything comes online at the same time, it is effectively managed. And you know, we, we've had experience in both scenarios and we've worked as a company in both scenarios. And I think it's just very important if you're gonna go to HVDC, you really think it through so that the risks are properly managed and the schedule for delivery is properly managed. But ultimately, I, I think that's certainly on the horizon for the industry. But DC is a more efficient way of, of transporting long energy over long distances. Correct, over long distances. Right, but it's much more, the upfront costs are more. You've got an inflection point at approximately 70 miles. 
that's when actually the, the losses start to really kind of mount up on the AC side. Because mm -hmm. the company I was talking about before, Anabaric, it wants to build the infrastructure for the undersea grid, at least off the shore of Massachusetts. That's their, and they're risking $650 million. They're putting, it, they're putting up their money saying, come, come join us. It's very interesting. But okay, um, do, 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 what happened to my fusion? I, I, wanna, I wanna skip, because I, I didn't read the other. Yeah. You mind if I skip? You know what happens, Bruce? People what? start voting. Uh, so Oh, okay, I get to vote. I, I like this fusion thing because we haven't, it's completely not part of our, our worldview right now, but does fusion, fusion atomic energy, right, the stuff of hydrogen bombs where you kind of fuse things at the, at the millions of, millions of uh, degrees Fahrenheit, like uh, 10 times the center of the sun hotter, are you fusing the atoms, the, this, the uh, nuclei, how does fusion figure into the future strategy in Massachusetts? Woo. Woo. Well, I, I kind of have an answer. Anybody want to try this one? Want to try? Well, so we have something called MIT here, and they have a fusion energy lab, and it's in a former cookie, uh, Nabisco cookie factory uh, warehouse, and, and they're generating, uh, they're going to be making these incredible magnets, which are going to hopefully make small modular fusion reactors, and um, unlike atomic energy, we know fission, which splits the atom, there's very, very, very little radioactive waste. And they're gonna, there's 19 companies, 20 companies around the country competing to make fusion possible, but it's been called the energy source of the future, and always will be, so who knows? <laughs> okay, How, anybody wanna chip on on fusion, anybody have a? How do you see the labor transition playing out in coal, fossil fuel heavy states? Ah, ooh, interesting. Given the rate, oh, this is a great question. Given the rate, we must transition to renewable energy to keep under two degrees Celsius. Two degrees Celsius being the IPCC, the International uh, Climate uh, Consortium, the limit on how much otherwise we skid off the road and into catastrophe. So how do you see the labor transition playing out in coal fossil heavy states? Ooh, that's such a good, how do we you know, get Kentucky to sign on? So I would, um, I mean, you made a point earlier, right, about where, where wind jobs exist, right? Wind jobs exist in mostly red counties across the, across the country. Um, solar jobs exist to a great degree in very rural communities where we have space to build large solar farms. Um, and so energy as, efficiency jobs too. Yeah, all over the country. everywhere. Um, and so I think that there has to be intentionality brought to it, right? And sort of sp special the, the, the you know, you talked about most of your offshore wind jobs are highly technical. Um, about two thirds of solar jobs, you don't need a, uh, a college degree, right? They are technical in a, in a similar way, but, but sort of easily accessible. And so as we think about how we retrain some workers from one energy source to a different energy source, I think there's lots of opportunity and there's, there are specific programs that are working on that. Um, but I also th think about sort of where the need is, right? And, and the need has historically been on the coasts, right? As we look at where the biggest solar states, they're California, Massachusetts, North Carolina. Um, but that's changing dramatically as markets change. And so places like Kentucky and Ohio and West Virginia have solar coming because the prices are dropping. And so we, I do think we have a real opportunity right now. I will say the other thing I want to say about, about the labor market is, I know in wind, but certainly in solar, we are super cognizant of what does our workforce look like? Like literally, what do we look like? And right now, we look like mostly white men. <laughs> uh, and so we are trying to change that, right? Trying to make sure that we really reflect the diversity of our nation. And so we have about 27% women um, in the solar workforce. And we have lots of programs and, and intentionality brought to making that higher. People of color are underrepresented in the solar workforce and similarly want to make that transition. And so it is certainly a, a sort of geography and where, you know, what other industries are folks transitioning from, but also making sure that in gender and, and race we are also reflective of our country. And of course the wind jobs, we've been talking about offshore wind, but wind is right down the middle of the country. I mean, that's where the wind is, Texas. Most of its energy, or 40% of its energy, is now coming you know, substantially from wind. So how, you know, so where you're, you know, how are we gonna make those fossil-heavy coal fuel with your technology? 
How's it? Well, I mean, it's, a, it's a similar story. What, what I love is that you don't have, it's not a finite range here. You've got this position where conventional fossil jobs can transition with the right training. What we've seen in Europe is a lot of emphasis is put onto that training. It's about enabling people to take these new jobs and there's no geography that isn't benefiting from renewable energy. Renewable energy pervades the whole nation. And so it's about finding the right technologies and the right training schemes to enable people to move into these, these, these new jobs, these future jobs that have a long horizon ahead of them. I mean, the lifespan of our wind farms is 25 to 30 years, and then one can repower as well. And we will need these electrons going forward. Of course, we can have energy efficiency. Of course, we can have different ways of utilizing them. But if anything, we're becoming more of an electrified society. We will be more efficient. But the electron generation will be an integral part of how we live for a long, long time to come. Are you, do you have a, does Orsted have an education subsidy program for like community colleges and training programs? Do you have that? Yeah, we work very closely with a number of universities, um, particularly in the Europe where we've had the experience of, of, of this many times. But I mean, we work with the University of Rhode Island. We work with some of the educational institutions uh, in Connecticut as well. Th this is the markets where we actually have the um, the PPAs agreed. Obviously, we are very hopeful that Massachusetts will soon be one of the power markets. purchase agreements. A power purchase agreement. This is the um, the contract to sell the power to an electric distribution company. Um, and you know where we want to build that is the markets which we serve, and you know hopefully Massachusetts will be there soon. I just want to share a story from my last job, where uh, you know I, I did mostly offshore oil and gas, right? Some portfolio was offshore wind, but it was much more nascent at the time. And so I actually went to Wind Power, which is the large wind conference in the U.S., and it was in New Orleans. And obviously, New Orleans is historically been the hub of the offshore oil and gas. I had over 300 employees down there, and we had. Um, the, the, the Louisiana Oilmen's Association hosted a reception Ooh, at tough Wind crowd. Power. This was in 2015, maybe, 2016. There were about 10 people there, right? They're mostly <laughs> people that were either people like me that really believed in wind or people from the association who probably wanted some free beer, right? It was like, this <laughs> seems really novel and weird. <laughs> and then you look now, today, right? And there are so many oil and gas companies who understand, I mean, Offshore technology is offshore technology. If you know how to operate in those harsh conditions to build big structures, you can get some more training around how to do that, but you have the basic skill set. And so there is sort of applicability across industry that is the gap is not nearly as large as we might think. And so barge operators and sort of uh, like underwater welders mm -hmm. and underwater electricians, they're probably agnostic whether they're working on a, a wind turbine or oil and gas facility as long as they have a job. The unions here, the steel workers unions, the metal workers, these guys are four square on all this stuff. You were gonna say something? No? Okay, do we need a Green New Deal uh, or can business and innovation reach our goals? I think we need a Green New Deal in the sense that it is, uh, the point of the Green New Deal to me is setting out a national aspiration for what we could do. And that is a really important thing to do. It's got the country talking about this at the national level again. And it's got folks that, you know, again, you wouldn't expect to be putting forward legislation around energy innovation. Um, doing so. And so that's a very important role that that Green New Deal resolution, not even a bill, plays um, in, in setting the conversation. So I think just even having the resolution out there has caused a lot of movement just in the last four or five months as people have realized that they have to respond to this. So there's, there's specific policies, and actually a lot of it is not very specific underneath, but uh, just having the statement out there, I think, is is really important. Let's do some lightning because we only have a few minutes left. And we'll right, we'll go right through these puppies. Okay, many startups. I feel like Alex Trebek or something like that. You know, energy for a hundred. Many startups focus on software and simple consumer hardware. Can how can uh, critical supply chain development for offshore wind or batteries be promoted? Supply chain being the industries that you needed to build your product. So many startups on, focus on software and simple consu hard, consumer hardware. How can critical supply chain development 
for offshore wind or batteries be promoted? How do we promote that? So I, I mean, think the state's actually doing a pretty good job, and, and you can comment uh, as well on how, from your perspective, this is working, but it's setting up the supply chain for the wind industry. There's been several conferences where they're bringing together uh, a whole bunch of different folks from really across the state that may not be traditionally from the wind industry, but they're bringing them together to figure out how they can supply this industry. So I think the state is actually playing a pretty strong role in trying to set up that supply chain for the wind industry. I don't know how successful it's been, but at least it's a conversation that is getting started. Then I think um, generally on the question of apps versus you know doing the hard stuff, I think that uh, we're lucky that this generation who are coming through our schools and, and graduating really want to have a big impact. So I don't know, maybe it's where we are here in Boston, but I see an awful lot of people who want to start companies and they want to do things that are really going to have an impact. And an app to get your lunch faster is just not having an impact. So if you can get yourself involved in something that is energy related, that is trying to address the climate challenge, you know, instantly you know, I mean, we've got 10 to 12 years to fix this problem, right? You know you're doing something meaningful every single day. So I think that's a real driver for this current generation. I, I wholeheartedly echo that. I think it's uh, tremendously um, I invigorating to, to see what what is happening in this space. And you know, as a company, we when I joined, we were in the basement of our oil and gas business. We were just a couple of people doing this thing called offshore wind. And you know, two years ago, we sold our sold our oil and gas business, and we're now striving for 100% renewable. And the company will get to 100% renewable virtually uh, by 2025. Uh, and you know, that Orsted is going to be a hundred percent renewable by 20, 2025. So that's obviously, if you think about the path for two degrees Celsius, then that's obviously taking us to 2050. We're trying to get there by 2025. And at the same time, it's a tremendous story to try and recruit talent wherever we are, you know, and it's great that, you know, uh, the, the Greentown labs and the trade industries and the people who want to work in the energy space see this it's 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 phenomenal and i can imagine that you know that there, there's probably is an inverse somewhere where there are fossil generators who, who maybe aren't seeing that ability to get the talent in and you know it, it, it's it's fun to be somewhere where people people are looking i think mean, the green new deal is really generational kids get it right they really get it they understand the horizon they understand it's their future um, I don't understand this question. One third of all atmospheric CO2 sinks down into the surface of the oceans. That's right. Um, so the ocean is a CO2 sink. Why not extract CO2 from ocean water to build batteries? Uh, I'm not sure. Is that a mechanical battery? Is that a chemical battery? CO2 doesn't work as a battery as far as I understand. Uh, why hasn't it happened? Somebody want to fill in the blank here? No? Okay, uh, can Abby speak more about the sort of state policies that New York had in place, uh, uh, there you go, had in place that made that auction possible, the, the sea ocean auction? What can Massachusetts do to support the market? Abby, you wanna? Sure, yeah, I'd have to uh, refresh my recollection for a minute. Um, so NYSERDA, uh, the New York State, whatever it's called, NYSERDA, um, and the governor made a commitment to offshore wind. Big time. Yes, big so like commitment. So like 3.5. So I think that was after our first auction. But at the time, it was a pretty significant um, financial commitment and commitment to offtake, right? So like any product, right? Like any product, it's going to be more valuable if you know who's going to buy it. And so uh, when the state of New York said, we, we are interested in buying this product, the value of that offshore lease went up um, significantly. So similarly... Massachusetts has shown similar leadership in terms of commitment. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are the kind of, th those policies, but also NYSERDA did a big conversation around helping to fund some of the ecological research, right? Some of the, the certainty around wildlife, around scallops and shrimp uh, in the New York Bite, and sort of other ways that states can support those efforts that, that put some of that burden, financial burden and risk on, on the state as a whole instead of on the private developer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a friend who was an entrepreneur, and he said to me, every business needs just one thing to succeed, a customer. 
Right. And the New York State became the customer, and then Massachusetts mandated customers be the utilities. Last question. Most people think of solar as a residential rooftop solution. Let me put a plug in for Watertown, where I'm from. First place in New England to mandate solar on certain size uh, new construction. What's happening on the larger scale, and how will that help adaptation? So, oh, ad adoption. Oh, well, that ad adaptation. Uh, what's happening on the larger scale, and how will that help adoption? You raise a really interesting dynamic that I manage on a daily basis, which is that the actual vast majority of the solar um, solar projects that have been deployed in the United States as of today are the large scale, utility scale projects. But the vast majority of people and politicians think of solar as on the residential. And so my job is to take the goodwill that comes from the residential and try to harness it into the good policy that benefits all sectors of the industry. So. Uh, we try to tell the story of solar, and that's why I always talk about all three segments of it. Um, but what's happening is if we, if we can harness that goodwill that comes from the residential side where people say, I get it, right? I understand what solar is, and I understand that it can help change my energy use, and I can have control over my own energy source. And I also want larger policies. What about all those folks that don't own a roof, right? And they, they're a renter, or they're in a multi-family housing, or they don't have the credit score. Community solar. Community solar, right? So that, so that helps drive community solar. And then they think, well, if I have community solar, what about, you know, I don't really like looking at that coal plant down the street. I'd much rather have solar power for my utility. And so that sort of taking all of that sort of political goodwill and making it into good policy, that's how they complement each other, in my opinion. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. So, Abby Ross Cooper and Dr. Emily Reichart from Green Labs and Francis, how do you pronounce your last name? Slingsby. Slingsby, very British. Oh, it sounds very British. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really fun. We weren't able to get to all of your questions, so if the panel wants to hang around for a few sure. minutes and um, on liquor and kind of kiosk outside, please give us your to levy a 5% tariff on all goods imported from Mexico starting next week. NPR's Kelsey Snell reports GOP senators shared their concerns with the White House officials at a weekly lunch.